A, a Christmas, Christmas Carol, Carol in Prose. Being a Ghost Story of Christmas by Charles Dickens. Marley's Ghost. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend, his sole mourner. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name, however. There it yet stood years afterwards above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Marley. He answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, was Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. External heat and cold had little influence on him. No warmth could warm, no cold could chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. No falling snow was more intent upon its purpose. No pelting rains less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect. They often came down handsomely, and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was a clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming, would tug their owners into doorways and up courts, and then would wag their tails as though they said, No eye at all is better than an evil eye, dark master. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance, what was the knowing ones call nuts to Scrooge. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, upon a Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting, foggy weather, and the city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who, in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation Scrooge had of his approach. Bah! said Scrooge. Humbug! Christmas a humbug, Uncle? You don't mean that, I am sure. I do. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour's richer? A time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a round dozen of months presented dead against you? If I had my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, nephew, keep Christmas your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Leave me alone, then. Much good may it do you. Much good has it ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good by which I have not profited. 
I dare say Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time when it has come around, apart from the veneration due its sacred origin. If anything belonging to it, call be apart from that as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow travelers to the grave and, and not just another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. <laughs> You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, uncle. <laughs> Come, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see him. Yes, indeed, he did. He went the whole length of the expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first. But why, cried Scrooge's nephew, why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if that were the only thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Nay, uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party. But I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon! And a Happy New Year! Good afternoon! His nephew went and left the room without an angry word, notwithstanding. The clerk, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hand, and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to the list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, it is more than unusually desirable that we should make some slight provisions for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. But under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the unoffending multitude, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We chose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the prisons and the workhouses. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will Scrooge, dismounting from his stool, 
tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. Oh, it's quite convenient, sir. It is not convenient, and it is not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself mightily ill-used, I'll be bound. Yes, sir. And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work? It's only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised that he would. And Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling. And the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide at the end of the lane of boys twenty times in honor of it being Christmas Eve, and then ran home as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Bluff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of a building up a yard. The building was old enough now and dreary enough for nobody lived in it but Scrooge. The other rooms being all let out as offices. Now it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door of this house except that it was very large. Also, that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residency at that place. Also, that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London. And yet, Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face, with a dismal light about it, like a, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but it looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look with ghostly spectacles turned up upon its ghostly forehead. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. Oh, he said, pooh, pooh, and closed the door with a bang. Well, the sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellars below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly, too, trimming his candle as he went. Up Scrooge went, not carrying a button for its being very dark. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked that. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table. Nobody under the sofa. A small fire in the grate. Spoon and basin ready. And the little saucepan for gruel. Scrooge had a cold in his head. Up upon the hob. Nobody under the bed. Nobody in the closet. Nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a, in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Lumber room as usual. Old fire guard, old shoes, two fish baskets, washing stand on three legs, and a poker. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat and and put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap and sat down before the very low fire 
to take his gruel. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell, that hung in the room and communicated, for some purpose now forgotten, with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. Soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This was succeeded by a clanking noise, deep down below, as if some person were dragging a, a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. Then he heard the noise much louder, on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It came on through the heavy door, and a specter passed into the room before his eyes. And upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost. The same face, the very same. Marley, in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights, and boots. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed it until now. Nor did he believe it even now, though he looked the phantom through and through, and saw it was standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes, and noticed the very texture of the folded kerchief bound about its head and chin, it was still incredulous. How now, said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever, what do you want with me? Much. Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, um, can you sit down? I can. Well, do it then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost, so transparent, might find himself in a condition to take a chair, and felt that, in the event of its being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace, as if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me. I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Oh, because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his horror. How much greater was his horror when, the phantom taking off his bandage round its head, as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Mercy! Dreadful apparition! Why do you trouble me? Why do spirits walk the earth? And why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men, and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. I cannot tell you all I would. A very little more is permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And weary journeys lie before me. 
seven years dead and traveling all the time. You travel fast on the wings of the wind. You might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years. Oh, blind man, blind man, not to know that ages of incessant labor by immortal creatures for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit, working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one life's opportunities misused. Yet I was like this man. I once was like this man. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing his hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the specter growing on at this rate and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me. My time is nearly gone. I will, but don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob, pray. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. You are always a good friend to me. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? I, I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow night when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us. It walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little so that when the apparition reached it, it was wide open. Oh, Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. Scrooge tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable. And being from the emotion that he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, he went straight to bed, without undressing, and fell asleep on the instant. The First of the Three Spirits When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of his bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber, until suddenly, The church clock tolled a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn aside by a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child, as like an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium, which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was that, from the crown of its head, there sprung a bright, clear jet of light, by which all this was visible, and which was doubtless the occasion of its using. In its duller moments, a great extinguisher for a cap, which it now held under its arm. Are you the spirit, sir? 
whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. The things that you will see with me are shadows of the things that have been. They will have no consciousness of us. Scrooge then made bold to inquire what business brought him there. Your welfare, rise and walk with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes. That bed was warm, and the thermometer a long way below freezing. That he was clad but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown, and a nightcap, and that he had a cold upon him at that time. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding that the spirit made towards the window, clasped its robe in supplication. I am immortal and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand there, said the spirit, laying it upon his heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood in the busy thoroughfares of a city. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that here, too, it was Christmas time. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked if Scrooge knew it. Know it? I was apprenticed here. They went in. At sight of an old man in an English wig, sitting behind such a high desk that, if he had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling, Scrooge cried out in great excitement, Why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again! Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself, from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice, Yo-ho there! Ebenezer! Dick! A living and moving picture of Scrooge's former self. A young man came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. My old fellow apprentice, bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yo-ho, my boys, said Fezziwig. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve. Dick, Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Clear away. There was nothing that wouldn't have cleared away, or couldn't have cleared away, with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off, as if it were diminished from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like 50 stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. In came three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. In they all came, anyhow and everyhow. Away they all went, twenty couple at once, hands half round and back again the other way. Away they all went, twenty couple at once, hands half round and back again the other way down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Old top couple always turning up in the wrong place. New top couple starting off again. As soon as they got there, all top couples at last, and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, Well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter, especially provided for that purpose. 
There were more dances, and there were forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled, when the fiddler struck up Sir Roger de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig, top couple too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them. Three or four and twenty pair of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if they had been twice as many four times, old Fezziwig would have been a match for them and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would have become of them next. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, turn your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle, and back again to your place, Fezziwig cut, cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwick took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually, as sheer he went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two apprentices, they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds which were under a counter in the back shop. A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that, said Scrooge, heated by the remark and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that, spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What is the matter? Nothing particular. Something, I think. No, no. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. My time grows short, observed the spirit. Quick! This was not addressed to Scrooge, or to anyone whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect, for again he saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of his life. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a black dress, in whose eyes there were tears. It matters little she said softly to Scrooge's former self. To you, very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. You fear the world too much. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you. Have I not? What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you. Have I ever sought release from our engagement? In words, no, never. In what then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in an atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end. If you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can I even believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? Or, choosing her, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do. And I release you, with a full heart for the love of whom you once were. Spirit, remove me from this place. I told you these were shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me, Scrooge exclaimed. I cannot bear it. Leave me. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. As he struggled with the spirit, he was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further, of being in his own bedroom. 
He had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. The, the second, second of the, the three spirits. Awaking, Scrooge found himself in his bedroom. There was no doubt about that. But it and his own adjoining sitting room, into which he shuffled in his slippers, attracted by a great light there, had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and the ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove. The leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light, as if many little mirrors had been scattered there. And such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney, as that petrifaction of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped upon the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and great bowls of punch. In easy state upon this couch there sat a giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch, in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and who raised it high to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, come in, and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You have never seen the like of me before. Never. Have never walked forth with the younger members of my family, meaning, for I am very young, my elder brothers born in these late years, pursued the phantom. I don't think I have. I am afraid I have not. Have, Have you many brothers, Spirit? More than 1,800. A tremendous family to provide for. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learnt a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you ought to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. The room and its contents all vanished instantly, and they stood in the city streets upon a snowy Christmas morning. Scrooge and the ghost passed on, invisible, straight into Scrooge's clerks, and on the threshold of the door the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinklings of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-room house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, brave in ribbons which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir in honor of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable park. And now, two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the baker's they had smelt the goose and known it for their own. And basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. "'What has ever got your precious father, then?' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'And your brother, Tiny Tim. And Martha weren't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour.' "'Here's Martha, mother,' said a girl, appearing as she spoke. "'Here's Martha, mother,' cried the two young Cratchits. "'Hurrah! There's such a goose, Martha!' "'Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are,' said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her. We had a deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind, so long as you are come, said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm Lord bless ye. No, no, there's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide! So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas, for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, 
with a sudden disclension in his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day. Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only a joke, so she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off to the wash house so that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave? asked Mrs. Cratchit when she had rallied Bob into his credulity, and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob. And better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool beside the fire. And while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, and stirred it round and round, and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce, and Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their post, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause, and Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all round the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by two young Cratchits, beat the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet every one had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onions to the eyebrows. But now the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witnesses, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose, a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello! A great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth, a smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other, with the laundresses next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushing but smiling proudly with the pudding, like a speckled cannonball so hard and firm, blazing in half a quartron of ignited brandy and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly, too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess that she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought at all that it was a small pudding for a large family. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. The compound and the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug. However, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. Which all the family re-echoed. 
God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his, as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side, and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Scrooge raised his head speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I am sure, said she, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer. Christmas Day. I'll drink his health, for your sake and the days, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not for his. Long life to him, a merry Christmas, and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings which had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care two pence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for five full minutes. After it had passed away, they were ten times merrier than before, from the mere relief of Scrooge the baleful being done with. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, five full and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favor when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, then told them what kind of work she had to do, and how many hours she worked at a stretch, and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest, tomorrow being a holiday she passed at home. Also, how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child traveling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family, they were not well dressed, their shoes were far from being waterproof, their clothes were scanty, and Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded, they looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting. Scrooge had his eye upon them, especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, as this scene vanished to hear hearty laughter. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize the laughter of his own nephew, and to find him in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing smiling by his side, and looking at his nephew with a smile. It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things, that while there is infection in disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world more irresistibly contagious than laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed, Scrooge's niece by marriage laughed as heartily as he, and their friends laughed out lustily as well. He said that Christmas was a humbug, as I live, said Scrooge's nephew, and he believed it too. More the shame for him, Fred, Scrooge's niece said indignantly. Bless those women, they never do anything by halves and are always earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking, captivating face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed as it no doubt often was. All kinds of good little dots around her chin that melted into one when she laughed and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in a little creature's head. Altogether, she was what you would have called provoking, but satisfactory too. Ah, perfectly satisfactory. 
He is a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment. And I have nothing to say against him. Who suffers from his ill whims? Himself? Always. Here. He takes it into his head to dislike us and won't come to dinner. What's the consequence? He doesn't get dinner, and it's not a good dinner, I grant you. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else said the same. They all had eaten heartily and had had dessert, and now were by the fire talking by lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because... I haven't had any great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper clearly had his eyes on one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he had always been a bachelor, and he said, well, what does a bachelor have to say about such things? I have no right to give an opinion on the subject. Whereas Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. After they had tea, there was music, for they were a very musical family, and they knew what they were about. When they sang a glee or a catch, I can assure you, especially Topper, who could growl out that bass with the best of him and never had the big veins in his head pop out or his face turn all red over it. No, he was good. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while, they played at forfeits. For it was good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when the mighty founder himself was a child. There was first a game of blind man's bluff, though. And I no more believe Topper was really blinded than I believe he had eyes in his boots. Because the way in which he went after the plum sister with the lace and the tucker was an outrage and credulity to human nature. Knocking down the fire irons tumbling over chairs, bumping against the piano, smothering himself in the curtains. <laughs> Wherever she was, that's where he was. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anyone else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did, and stood there, he would have made a play at catching you, but never sees you, but would instantly sidestep you and direct himself towards the plump sister. Here's a new game, said Scrooge. One and a half hour, one hour, only spirit. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what. He only answered to their questions yes or no, as the case was. The fire of the questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a living animal. A rather disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes and lived in London and grunted and sometimes and walked about the streets and wasn't made a show of and wasn't led by anybody and didn't live in a menagerie and never killed in a market and was not a horse or an ass or a cow or a bull or a tiger or a dog or a pig or a cat or a bear. <laughs> At every new question put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter. And it was so inexplicably tickling to him, he would get up and walk around and laugh. At last, the plump sister cried out, I found it. I found out what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it, cried Fred. It's your Uncle Scrooge. Which it certainly was. Admiration was the sentiment, though some objected to the reply that it was a bear ought to have been yes. Uncle Scrooge imperceptibly became so gay and lighthearted that he would have drank to the unconscious company in an inaudible speech. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last words spoken by his nephew. And he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw and far they went and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds and they were cheerful on foreign lands and they were close at home by struggling men and they were made patient in their greater hope by poverty and it was rich. An almshouse, hospital, and jail and miseries 
every refuge where vain man and his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. Suddenly, as they stood together in an open space, the bell struck 12. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it no more. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of Bob Marley and lifted up his eyes and beheld a solemn phantom draped and hooded coming like a mist along the ground towards him. The Last of the Spirits The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the air through which this spirit moved it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Ghost of the future? I fear you more than any specter I have seen, but as I know your presence is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, lead on. The night is waning fast and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring about them. But there they were, in the heart of it, on change, among the merchants. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said the great fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it either way. Only know he's dead. Well, when did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. Well, what was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows, said the first with a yawn. Uh, <clears throat> what has he done with his money? asked a red-faced gentleman. I haven't heard, said the man with the large chin. Company, perhaps. Hadn't left it to me, that's all I know. Bye, bye. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to conversation apparently so trivial. But feeling assured that it must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. It could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past, and this ghost's province was the future. He looked about that very place for his own image, but another man stood in his accustomed corner. And though the clock pointed to his usual time of day of being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that poured in through the porch. It gave him little surprise, however, for he had been revolving in his mind a change of life, and he thought and hoped he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. They left this busy scene and went into an obscure part of the town to a low shop where iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were bought. A gray-haired rascal of great age sat smoking his pipe. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black. After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all burst into a laugh. Let the charwoman alone to be first, cried she who had entered first. Let the laundress alone to be second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be third. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance. If we hadn't all three met here without meaning it. <laughs> you couldn't have met in a better place. You were made free of it long ago, you know, and the other two ain't strangers. What have you got to sell? And what have you got to sell? Half a minute. 
it's patience, Joe, and you shall see. What odds, then? What odds, Miss Dilber? said the woman. Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. Who's the worse for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. Miss Dilber, whose manner was remarkable for general appropriation, said, No, indeed, ma'am. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying, gasping out there alone by himself. It's the truest word that ever was spoken. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier judgment, and it should have been. You may depend upon it. If I could have laid my hands on anything else, open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. Joe went down on his knees for the greater convenience of opening the bundle, and dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. What do you call this? Bed curtains? Ah, bed curtains. Don't drop that oil on those blankets now. His blankets? Whose else do you think? He isn't likely to take cold without him, I dare say. Ah. You may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it by dressing him up in it if it hadn't been for me. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. Spirit, I see. I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? The scene had changed. And now he almost touched a bare, uncurtained bed. A pale light rising in the outer air fell straight upon this bed, and on it, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this plundered, unknown man. Spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with a death, or this dark chamber spirit will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him to poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in needlework, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard those words? He had not dreamed them. The boy must have read them out as he and the spirit crossed the threshold. Why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The color hurts my eyes, she said. The color? Ah, oh, poor tiny Tim. They're better now again. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used these few last evenings, mother. I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed, and so have I cried Peter, often, and so have I, exclaimed another, so had all. But he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble, no trouble. And there is your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him, and little Bob in his comforter, he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they all tried who should help him to it most. Then the two young Cratchits got upon his knees and laid, each child, a little cheek against his face as if they said, Don't mind it, father. Don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. They would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You went today then, Robert? Yes, my dear, returned Bob. I wish you could have gone. 
It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little child. He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been farther apart, perhaps, than they were. Spectre, said Scrooge. Something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was, with the covered face, whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him to a dismal, wretched churchyard. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they shadows of the things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, to which, if persevered in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave, his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man who lay upon the bed? No, spirit. Oh, no, no. Spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been but for this intercourse. Why show me this, if I am past all hope? Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. For the first time, the kind hand faltered. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on the stone. Holding up his hands in one last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. The end of it. And the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own, to make amends in. He was checked in his transports by the churches, ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, no night. Clear, bright, stirring, golden day. What's today, cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes, who perhaps had loitered in to look about him. Huh? What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why, Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day? I haven't missed it. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Do you know the poultry shop in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope I did. An intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What, the one as big as me? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. Are you joking? exclaimed the boy. No, no, I am in earnest. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here, that I may give them the direction where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. He shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Timey Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob Twilby. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did, somehow, and went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. It was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped them short off in a minute, like sticks of sealing wax. Scrooge dressed himself all in his best, 
and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present. And walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word that three or four good-humored fellows said, Good morning, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards that of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, these were the blithest in his ears. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. But he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear? said Scrooge to the girl. Nice girl, very. Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? He's in the dining room, sir, with his mistress. He knows me, said Scrooge, with his hands already on the dining room lock. I'll go in there, my dear. Fred! Why, bless my soul, cried Fred. Who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I have come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in? It's a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office the next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. Bob was a full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. Bob's hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter, too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I'm very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now I'll tell you what, my friend, I am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. Therefore, Scrooge continued leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again, and therefore, I will raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor you to assist your struggling family, and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking Bishop Bob. Make up the fires and buy a second coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend as good a master and as good a man as the good old city knew or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but his own heart laughed, and that was quite good enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived in that respect upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone!